Chapter Thirty Five of Bunyip Land. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Bunyip Land by George Manville Fenn. Chapter Thirty Five. How Jack Penny fired a straight shot. There was no stopping Jimmy's snoring. Pokes and kicks only intensified the noise, so at last we let him lie, and I went on in a doleful key to the end. "'Oh, it ain't so very bad, after all,' said Jack Penny, in his slow drawl. "'I call it a good night's work.' "'Good, Jack?' "'Yes, well, ain't it?' he drawled. "'While well, you've got back safe, and you don't know that the doctor won't get back, and you've done what you came to do, you've found your father.' "'But, but suppose, Jack Penny,' I said, they they do him some injury for what is past. Tain't likely, drawled Jack. They've kept him all this time. Why should they want to, well, kill him, if that's what you're afraid of now? Yes, I said sadly. Gammon, tain't likely. If you'd got an old kangaroo in a big cage, and the young kangaroo came and tried to get him away, you wouldn't go and kill the old kangaroo for it. No, no, I said. Of course not. I didn't mean to call your father an old kangaroo, Joe Carstairs. I only meant it to be an instance, like. I say, do kick that fellow for snoring so. It is of no use to kick him, poor fellow, and besides, he's tired. He's a good fellow, Jack. Yes, I suppose he is, said Jack Penny, but he's awfully black. Well, he can't help that. And he shines so, continued Jack, in tones of disgust. I never saw a black fellow with such shiny skin. I say, though, didn't you feel in a stew, Joe Carstairs, when you thought it was a black fellow lugging you off? I did, I said, and when, afterwards, hissed, is that anything? We gazed through the bushes at the darkness outside, and listened intently, but there was no sound save Jimmy's heavy breathing, and I went on. When afterwards I found it was the black, I turned queer and giddy. Perhaps it was the effect of the blow I got, but I certainly felt as if I should faint. I didn't know I was so girlish. Jack Penny did not speak for a few minutes, and I sat thinking bitterly of my weakness as I stroked Jip's head, the faithful beast having curled up between us and laid his head upon my lap. I seemed to have been so cowardly, and weary and dejected as I was, I wished that I had grown to be a man, with a man's strength and indifference to danger. "'Oh, I don't know,' said Jack Penny suddenly. "'Don't know what?' I said sharply, as he startled me out of my thinking fit. "'Oh, about being girlish and—and—and, and, and, well, cowardly, I suppose you mean.' "'Yes, cowardly,' I said bitterly. "'I thought I should be so brave, and that when I had found where my father was, I should fight and bring him away from among the savages.' "'Ah, yes,' said Jack Penny dryly. "'That's your sort.' That's like what you read in books and papers about boys of fifteen and sixteen and seventeen. They're wonderful chaps who take young women in their arms and then jump on horseback with them and gallop off at full speed. Some of them have steel coats like lobsters on and heavy helmets, and that makes it all the easier. I've read about some of them chaps who wielded their swords. They never swing them about and chop and stab with them, but wield them, and they kill three or four men every day and think nothing of it. I used to swallow all that stuff, but I'm not such a guffin now. There was a pause here, while Jack Penny seemed to be thinking. Why, some of these chaps swim across rivers with a man under their arm, and if they're on horseback they sing out a battle cry and charge into a whole army, and everybody's afraid of em. I say, ain't it jolly nonsense, Joe Carstairs? I suppose it is, I said sadly, for I had believed in some of these heroes, too. I don't believe the boy ever lived who didn't feel in an awful stew when he was in danger. Why, men do at first, before they get used to it. There was a chap came to our place last year, and did some sheep herding for father about six months. He'd been a soldier out in the Crimean War, and got wounded twice in the arm and in the leg. Big wounds, too. He told me that when they got the order to advance, him and his mates, they were all of a tremble, and the officers looked as pale as could be, some of them but every man tramped forward steady enough, and it wasn't till they began to see their mates drop that the want to fight began to come. They felt savage, he says, then, and as soon as they were in the thick of it there wasn't a single man felt afraid. We sat in silence for a few minutes, and then he went on again. 
If men feel afraid sometimes, I don't see why boys shouldn't. And as to those chaps who go about in books killing men by the dozen, and never feeling to mind it a bit, I think it's all gammon. Hiss! Jack Penny, what's that? I whispered. There was a faint crashing noise out in the forest just then, and I knew from the sound close by me that the black who was sharing our watch must have been lifting his spear. I picked up my gun, and I knew that Jack had taken up his and thrown himself softly into a kneeling position, as we both strove to pierce the darkness and catch sight of what was perhaps a coming enemy. As we watched, it seemed as if the foliage of the trees high up had suddenly come into view. There was a gray look in the sky, and for the moment I thought I could plainly make out the outline of bushes on the opposite side of the gully. Then I thought I was mistaken, and then again it seemed as if I could distinctly see the outline of a bush. A minute later, and with our hearts beating loudly, we heard the rustling go on, and soon after we could see that the bushes were being moved. It is the doctor, I thought, but the idea was false, I knew, for if it had been he his way would have been down into the stream, which he would have crossed, while whoever this was seemed to be undecided and had to be gazing about intently as if in search of something. When we first caught a glimpse of the moving figure it was fifty yards away. Then it came to within forty, went off again, and all the time the day was rapidly breaking. The tree-tops were plainly to be seen, and here and there one of the great masses of foliage stood out quite clearly. Just then the black, who had crept close to my side, pointed out the figure on the opposite bank, now dimly seen in the transparent dawn. It was that of an Indian who had stopped exact opposite the clump of bushes which acted as a screen to our place of refuge, and stooping down he was evidently trying to make out the mouth of the cave. He saw it, apparently, for he uttered a cry of satisfaction, and leaping from the place of observation he stepped rapidly down the slope. "'He has found us out,' I whispered. "'But he mustn't come, all the same,' said Jack Penny, and as he spoke I saw that he was taking aim. "'Don't shoot!' I cried, striking at his gun, but I was too late, for as I bent towards him he drew the trigger. There was a flash, a puff of smoke, a sharp retort that echoed from the mouth of the cave, and then, with a horrible dread upon me, I sprang up and made for the entrance, followed by Jack and the blacks. It took us but a minute to get down into the stream-bed, and then to climb up amongst the bushes to where we had seen the savage, and neither of us now gave a thought of there being danger from his companions. What spirit moved Jack Penny I cannot tell. That which moved me was an eager desire to know whether a horrible suspicion was likely to be true, and to gain the knowledge I proceeded on first till I reached the spot where the man had fallen. It was a desperate venture, for he might have struck at me, wounded merely with war-club or spear. But I did not think of that. I wanted to solve the horrible doubt, and I had just caught sight of the fallen figure lying prone upon its face when Jimmy uttered a warning cry, and we all had to stoop down amongst the bushes, for it seemed as if the savage's companions were coming to his help. Chapter 36 of Bunyip Land This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Bunyip Land by George Manville Finn Chapter 36 How the Doctor Found a Patient Ready to His Hand We waited for some minutes crouched there among the bushes, listening to the coming of those who forced their way through the trees, while moment by moment the morning light grew clearer, the small birds twittered, and the parrots screamed. We could see nothing, but it was evident that two, if not three, savages were slowly descending the slope of the ravine towards where we were hidden. The wounded man uttered a low groan that thrilled me, and then sent a cold shudder through my veins, for I was almost touching him, and set aside the feeling of horror at having been, as it were, partner in inflicting his injury, there was the sensation that he might recover sufficiently to revenge himself upon us by a blow with his spear. The sounds came nearer, and it was now so light that as we watched we could see the bushes moving, and it seemed to me that more of this horrible bloodshed must ensue. We were crouching close, but the wounded man was moaning, 
and his companions might at any moment hear him and then discovery must follow while if on the other hand we did not resist all hope of rescuing my poor father would be gone we must fight i said to myself setting my teeth hard and bringing my gun to bear on the spot where i could see something moving at the same time i tried to find where jack penny was hiding but he was out of sight at the risk of being seen i rose up a little so as to try and get a glimpse of the coming enemy but though the movement among the bushes was plain enough i only caught one glimpse of a black body and had i been disposed to shoot it was too quick for me and was gone in an instant they were coming nearer and in an agony of excitement i was thinking of attempting to back away and try to reach the cave when i felt that i could not get jack penny and the black to act with me unless i showed myself and this meant revealing our position and there all the time were the enemy steadily making their way right towards us what shall i do i said to myself as i realized in a small way what must be the feelings of a general who finds that the battle is going against him i must call to jack penny cooey rang out just then from a little way to my right and jimmy looked up from his hiding place is carstairs there cried the familiar voice of the doctor and as with beating heart i sprang up he came staggering wearily towards me through the clinging bushes my dear boy he cried with his voice trembling what i have suffered on your account i thought you were a prisoner no i exclaimed delighted at this turn in our affairs jimmy helped me to escape i say you don't think i ran away and deserted you my dear boy he cried i was afraid that you would think this of me but there thank heaven you are safe and though we have not rescued your father we know enough to make success certain i'm afraid not i said hastily the savages have discovered our hiding place no yes and one of them was approaching it just now when jack penny shot him down this is very unfortunate where what close here i had taken his hand to lead him to the clump of bushes where the poor wretch lay and on parting the boughs and twigs we both started back in horror my boy what have you done cried the doctor as i stood speechless there by his side we have not so many friends that we could afford to kill them but already he was busy feeling the folly of wasting words and down upon his knees to place the head of our friend the prisoner of the savages in a more comfortable position before beginning to examine him for his wound bullet right through the shoulder said the doctor in a short abrupt manner and as he spoke he rapidly tore up his handkerchief and plugged and bound the wound supplementing the handkerchief with the long scarf which he wore round the waist now tee hee jimmy help me carry him to the cave jimmy carry em all long right way put em on jimmy's back cried my black companion and this seeming to be no bad way of carrying the wounded man in such a time of emergency jimmy stooped down exasperating me the while by grinning as if it was good fun till the sufferer from our mistake was placed upon his back when he exclaimed lot much heavy heavy twice two sheep heavy clear de bush we hastily drew the boughs aside and jimmy steadily descended the steep slope entered the rivulet crossed and then stopped for a moment beneath the overhanging boughs before climbing to the cabin here let me help you said the doctor holding out his hand yes said jimmy drawing his waddy and boomerang from his belt hold em tight i'm all in blackfellow way then seizing the boughs he balanced the wounded man carefully and drew himself steadily up step by step exhibiting wonderful strength of muscle till he had climbed to the entrance of the cave where he bent down and crawled in on hands and knees waiting till his burden was removed from his back and then getting up once more to look round smiling jimmy carry lot of men like that way we laid the sufferer on one of the beds of twigs that the savages had made for us and here the doctor set himself to work to more securely bandage his patient's shoulder jack penny looking on 
resting upon his gun and wearing a countenance full of misery. There, said the doctor when he had finished, I think he will do now. Two inches lower, Master Penny, and he would have been a dead man. I couldn't help it, drawled Jack Penny. I thought he was a savage coming to kill us. I'm always doing something. There was never such an unlucky chap as I am. Oh, you meant what you did for the best, said the doctor, laying his hand on Jack Penny's shoulder. What did he want to look like a savage for, grumbled Jack. Who was going to know that anyone dressed up, no, I mean dressed down, like that was an Englishman? It was an unfortunate mistake, Penny. You must be more careful if you mean to handle a gun. Here, take it away, said Jack Penny bitterly. I won't fire it off again. I was very nearly making the same mistake, I said out of compassion for Jack Penny. He seemed so much distressed. I had you and Tee Hee covered in turn as you came up, Doctor. Then I'm glad you did not fire, he said. There, keep your peace, Penny. We may want its help. As for your friend here, he has a painful wound, but I don't think any evil will result from it. Hist, he is coming too. Our conversation had been carried on in a whisper, and we now stopped short and watched the doctor's patient in the dim twilight of the cavern, as he unclosed his eyes and stared first up at the ceiling and then about him, till his eyes rested upon us, when he smiled. "'Am I much hurt?' he said, in a low, calm voice. "'Oh, no,' said the doctor. "'A bullet wound, not a dangerous one at all.' To my astonishment he went on talking quite calmly, and without any of the dazed look and the strange habit of forgetting his own tongue to continue in that of the people among whom he had been a prisoner for so long. "'I thought I should find you here,' he said, "'and I came on, thinking that perhaps I could help you.' "'Help us? Yes, of course you can. You shall help us to get Mr. Carstairs away.' "'Poor fellow, yes,' he said softly and in so kindly a way that I crept closer and took his hand. We tried several times to escape, but they overtook us and treated us so hard that of late we had grown resigned to our fate. I exchanged glances with the doctor, who signed to me to be silent. It was a very hard one, very hard, the wounded man continued, and then he stopped short, looking straight before him at the forest, seen through the opening of the cave. By degrees his eyelids dropped, were raised again, and then fell, and he seemed to glide into a heavy sleep. The doctor motioned us to keep away, and we all went to the mouth of the cave, to sit down and talk over the night's adventure, the conversation changing at times to a discussion of our friend's mental affection. The shock of the wound has affected his head beneficially, it seems, the doctor said at last. Whether it will last, I cannot say. At least it seemed to me that the doctor was saying those or similar words from out of a mist, and then all was silent. The fact was that I had been out all night, exerting myself tremendously, and I had now fallen heavily asleep. End of chapter 36 Recording by Tim McKenzie Chapter 37 of Bunyip Land. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Bunyip Land by George Manville Finn. Chapter 37 How We Passed Through a Great Peril. It was quite evening when I awoke, as I could see by the red glow amongst the trees. I was rested, but confused, and lay for some minutes thinking, and wondering what had taken place on the previous day. It all came back at once, and I was just in the act of rising and going to see how our poor friend was, when I felt a hand press me back, and turning I saw it was Jack Penny who was pointing with the other towards the entrance of the cave. 
"'What is it?' I whispered. But I needed no telling, for I could see that a group of the blacks were on the other side of the ravine, pointing in the direction of the bushes that overhung our refuge, and gesticulating and talking together loudly. "'They know where we are, then,' I thought, and glancing from one to the other in the dim light, I saw that my opinion was shared by the doctor and our black followers, who all seemed to be preparing for an encounter, taking up various places of vantage behind blocks of stone, where they could ply their bows and arrows and make good use of their spears. Just then the doctor crept towards me and placed his lips to my ear. "'They have evidently tracked us, my lad,' he said, "'and we must fight for it. There is no chance beside without we escape by the back here and give up the object of our search. We must fight, doctor, I said, though I trembled as I spoke, and involuntarily glanced at Jack Penny, wondering even in those critical moments whether he too felt alarmed. I think now it was very natural. I felt horribly ashamed of it then. Whether it was the case, or that Jack Penny was only taking his tent from the greeny, reflected light in the cavern, certainly he looked very cadaverous and strange. He caught my eye, and blew out his cheeks, and began to whistle softly as he rubbed the barrel of his gun with his sleeve. Turning rather jauntily toward the doctor, he said softly, "'Suppose I am to shoot now, doctor?' "'When I give the order,' said the latter, coldly. "'There won't be any mistake this time?' "'No,' said the doctor, quietly. "'There will not be any mistake this time.' He stopped and gazed intently at the savages who were cautiously descending toward the stream, not in a body, but spread out in a line." Fire first with large shot, he said softly. If we can frighten them without destroying life, we will. Now creep each of you behind that clump of stones and be firm. Mind it is by steadily helping one another in our trouble that we are strong. I gave him a quick nod. It was no time for speaking. And crept softly to my place passing pretty close to where our friend lay wounded and quietly asleep. The next minute both Jack Penny and I were crouched behind what served as a breastwork, with our pieces ready, the doctor being on our left, and the blacks, including Jimmy, right in front, close to the mouth of the cave. "'We must mind and not hit the blacks,' whispered Jack. "'I mean, our chaps. Lie down, Jip.' The dog was walking about in an impatient, angry manner, uttering a low snarl now and then, and setting up the hair all about his neck till in the dim light he looked like a hyena. Jip turned to his master almost a reproachful look, and then looked up at me as if saying, Am I to be quiet at a time like this? Directly after, though, he crouched down with his paws straight out before him, and his muzzle directed toward the enemy, ready, when the struggle began, to make his teeth meet in someone. The savages were all the time coming steadily on, lower and lower down the bank, till suddenly one of them stopped short and uttered a low cry. Several ran to his side at once, and we could see them stoop down and examine something among the bushes, talking fiercely the while. "'They've found out where our friend was wounded, Jack Penny,' I said. "'Think so?' he said slowly. "'Well, I couldn't help it. I didn't mean to do it, I declare.' I whispered, and now my heart began to beat furiously, for the blacks, apparently satisfied, began to spread out again, descended to the edge of the little stream, and then stopped short. If I had not been so excited by the coming danger, I should have enjoyed the scene of this group of strongly built naked savages, their jetty black shining skins 
bronzed by the reflections of orange and golden green, as the sun flooded the gorge with warm light, making every action of our enemies plain to see, while, by contrast, it threw us more and more into the shade. They paused for a few moments at the edge of the stream, so close now that they could touch each other by simply stretching out a hand, and it was evident by the way all watched a tall black in the center of the line that they were waiting his orders to make a dash up into the cave. Those were terrible minutes. We could see the opal of our enemy's eyes and the white line of their teeth as they slightly drew their lips apart in the excitement of waiting the order to advance. Every man was armed with bow and arrows, and from their wrists hung by a thong a heavy waddy, a blow from which was sufficient to crush in any man's skull. "'They're coming now,' I said in a low voice, the words escaping me involuntarily. And then I breathed again, for the tall savage, evidently the leader, said something to his men, who stood fast, while he walked boldly across the stream beneath the overhanging bushes, and one of these began to sway as the chief tried to draw himself up. I glanced at the doctor, being sure that he would fire, when, just as the chief was almost on a level with the floor of the cave, there was a rushing, scratching noise, and the most hideous howling rose from just in front of where I crouched, while Jip leaped up, hair bristling, and answered it with a furious howl. The savage dropped back into the water with a tremendous splash, and rushed up the slope after his people, not one of them stopping till they were close to the top, when Jimmy raised his grinning face and looked round at us. Um tink big bunyip in um hole, um make um all run just fast away, away. He had unmistakably scared the enemy, for they collected together in consultation, but our hope that they might now go fell flat, for they once more began to descend, each one tearing off a dead branch or gathering a bunch of dry ferns as he came, and at the same moment the idea struck Jack Penny and me that they believed some fierce beast was in the hole and that they were coming to smoke it out. The blacks came right down into the rivulet, and though the first armfuls of dry wood and growth they threw beneath the cave mouth went into the water, they served as a base for the rest, and in a very short time a great pile rose up, and this they fired. For a few moments there was a great fume, which floated slowly up among the bushes, but very soon the form of the cavern caused it to draw right in, the opening at the back acting as a chimney. First it burned briskly, then it began to roar. Then to our horror we found that the place was beginning to fill with suffocating smoke and hot vapor, growing more dangerous moment by moment. Fortunately the smoke and noise of the burning made our actions safe from observation, and we were thus able to carry our wounded right to the back, where the air was purer and it was easier to breathe. It was a terrible position, for the blacks, encouraged by their success, piled on more and more brushwood and the great fronds of fern which grew in abundance on the sides of the little ravine, and as the green boughs and leaves were thrown on they hissed and spluttered and sent forth volumes of smoke which choked and blinded us till the fuel began to blaze, when it roared into the cave and brought with it a quantity of hot but still breathable air. "'Keep a good heart, my lad,' said the doctor. "'No, no, Penny. Are you mad? Lie down, lie down. Don't you know that while the air high up is suffocating, that low down can be breathed? No, I couldn't tell, said Jack Penny dolefully, as he first knelt down, then laid his head close to the ground. 
I didn't know things were going to be so bad as this, or I shouldn't have come. I don't want to have my dog burned to death. Jip seemed to understand him, for he uttered a low whine and laid his nose in his master's hand. Burned to death, said the doctor in a tone full of angry excitement. Of course not. No one is going to be burned to death. Through the dim, choking mist I could see that there was a wild and anxious look in the doctor's countenance, as he kept going near the mouth of the cave, and then hurrying back, blinded and in agony. We had all been in turn to the narrow rift at the end through which we had been able to see the sky and the waving leaves of the tree, but now all was dark with the smoke that rolled out. This had seemed to be a means of escape, but the difficulty was to ascend the flat, chimney-like place, and when the top was reached we feared that it would only be for each one who climbed out to make himself a mark for the savage's arrows. Hence, then, we had not made the slightest attempt to climb it. Now, however, our position was so desperate that Jimmy's proposal was listened to with eagerness. Place too much big hot, he said. Choke em, choke em like a wallaby. Go up. He caught hold of the doctor's scarf of light network, a contrivance which did duty for bag, hammock, or rope in turn, and the wearer rapidly twisted it from about his waist. Now, Mass Jack Penny, tend here, he cried, and Jack was placed just beneath the hole. Jack Penny understood what was required of him, and placing his hands against the edge of the rift he stood firm, while Jimmy took the end of the doctor's scarf in his teeth and proceeded to turn him into a ladder, by whose means he might get well into the chimney-like rift, climb up, then lower down the scarf rope to help the rest of us. As I expected, the moment Jimmy caught Jack Penny's shoulders and placed one foot upon him. My companion doubled up like a jointed rule, and Jimmy and he rolled upon the floor of the cave. At any other time we should have roared with laughter at Jimmy's disgust and angry torrent of words, but it was no time for mirth, and the doctor took Jack Penny's place as the latter drawled out. I couldn't help it. My back's so weak. I begin to wish I hadn't come. That's fine, grunted Jimmy, who climbed rapidly up, standing on the doctor's shoulders, making no scruple about placing a foot upon his head, and then we knew by his grunting and choking sounds that he was forcing his way up. The moment he had ceased to be of use, the doctor stood aside, and it was as well, for first a few small stones fell, then there was a crash, and I felt that Jimmy had come down but it only proved to be a mass of loose stone, which was followed by two or three more pieces of earth and rock. Next came a tearing sound as of bushes being broken and dragged away, and to our delight the smoke seemed to rush up the rift with so great a current of air that fresh breath of life came to us from the mouth of the cave, and with it hope. In those critical moments everything seemed dreamlike and strange. I could hardly see what took place for the smoke, my companions looking dim and indistinct, and somehow the smoke seemed to be despair, and the fresh hot wind, borne with the crackling flames that darted through the dense vapor, so much hope. Tai hai come long next him, whispered Jimmy and the black ran to the opening eagerly but hesitated and paused, ending by seizing me and pushing me before him to go first. No, no, I said, let's help the wounded man first. Don't waste time, said the doctor angrily. Up, Joe, and you can help Hall. I obeyed, willingly and unwillingly, but I wasted no time. With the help of the doctor and the scarf, I had no difficulty in climbing up the rift, which afforded good foothold at the side, and in less than a minute I was beside Jimmy, breathing the fresh air 
and seeing the smoke rise up in a cloud from our feet. Pull, said the doctor, in a hoarse whisper that seemed to come out of the middle of the smoke. Jimmy and I hauled, and somehow or another we got Jack Penny up, choking and sneezing so that he was obliged to lie down amongst the bushes, and I was afraid he would be heard, till I saw that we were separated from the savages by a huge mass of stony slope. Two of the black bearers came next easily enough, and then the scarf had to be lowered down to its utmost limits. I knew why, and watching the proceedings with the greatest concern as Jimmy and one of the blacks reached down into the smoky rift and held the rope at the full extent of their arms. Now, said the doctor's voice, and the two hardy fellows began to draw the scarf with its weight coming up so easily that I knew the doctor and one of the blacks must be lifting the wounded man below. Poor fellow, he must have suffered the most intense agony, but he did not utter a sigh. Weak as he was, he was quite conscious of his position and helped us by planting his feet wherever there was a projection in the rift, and so we hauled him up and laid him on the sand among the bushes, where he could breathe, but where he fainted away. The rest easily followed, but not until the doctor had sent up every weapon and package through the smoke. Then came his turn, but he made no sign, and in an agony of horror I mastered my dread and, seizing the scarf, lowered myself down into the heat and smoke. It was as I feared. He had fainted and was lying beneath the opening. My hands trembled so I could hardly tie a knot, but, knowing, as I did, how short the scarf was, I secured it tightly round one of his wrists and called to them to haul, just as Jimmy was coming down to my help. He did not stop, but dropped down beside me, and together we lifted the fainting man, called to them to drag, and he was pulled up. Here, catch hold, came from above the next moment in Jack Penny's voice, and to my utter astonishment down came the end of the scarf at once, long before they could have had time to untie it from the doctor's wrist. Up, Jimmy, I cried, as I realized that it was the other end that Jack Penny had had the news to lower at once. No, shan't go, Master Joe Carstairs. Go on, sir, I cried. No, shan't. Devil, 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 he cried, pushing me to the hole. To have gone on fighting would have meant death for both, for the savages were yelling outside and piling on the bushes and fern fronds till they roared. I caught the scarf then and was half hauled, half scrambled up, to fall down blinded and suffocated almost, only able to point below. I saw them lower the scarf again, and after what seemed a tremendous time, Jimmy's black figure appeared. Almost at the same moment there were tongues of flame mingled with the smoke, and Jimmy threw himself down and rolled over and over, sobbing and crying. Burnham, Hottam, oh, Burnham, Burnham, Burnham! There was a loud roar and a rush of flame and smoke out of the rift, followed by what seemed to be a downpour of the smoke that hung over us like a canopy just as if it was all being sucked back, and then the fire appeared to be smoldering, and up through the smoke that now rose slowly came the dank, strange smell of exploded powder, and the sounds of voices talking eagerly, but coming like a whisper to where we lay. End of chapter 37 How Chapter 38 of Bunyip Land This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Bunyip Land by George Manville Fenn. Chapter 38. How the Doctor Said Thank You in a Very Quiet Way. For some little time we did nothing but lie there blackened and half-choked, blinded almost, listening to the sound that came up that rift, for the question now was whether the savages would know that we were there, 
or would attribute the roar to that of some fierce beast that their fire and smoke had destroyed. The voices came up in a confused gabble, and we felt that if the blacks came up the rift we could easily beat them back, but if they came round by some other way to the rocky patch of forest where we were, our state was so pitiable that we could offer no defense. Jimmy had been applying cool leaves to his legs for some minutes as we lay almost where we had thrown ourselves, seeming to want to do nothing but breathe the fresh air, when all at once he came to where the doctor and I now rested ourselves upon our elbows, and were watching the smoke that came up gently now and rose right above the trees. "'Jimmy no hurt now. Roast black fellow,' he said, grinning. "'Jimmy no powder go bang pop down slow.' Yes, said the doctor, I was trying to get that last canister when I was overcome by the smoke, and just managed to reach the bottom of the rift. Who was it saved me? Jimmy, Jimmy, said the black proudly. My brave fellow, cried the doctor, catching the black's hand. Jimmy come long, Mass Joe. Haul Mass Doctor up. Mass Doctor no wiggle Jimmy again, eat much pig. The doctor did not answer, for he had turned to me and taken my hand. Did you come down, Joe? he said softly. "'Of course I did,' I replied quietly, though I felt very uncomfortable. "'Thank you,' he said quietly, and then he turned away. "'Black fellow here powder bang,' said Jimmy, grinning. "'Tinkum big bunyip. I'll go away now.' I turned to him sharply, listening the while. "'Yes, I'll go along. Tink bunyip. Kill him dead. No kill bunyip, oh no.' There was the sound of voices, but they were more distant and then they seemed to come up the rift in quite a broken whisper, and the next moment they had died away. "'Safe, doctor,' I said, and we all breathed more freely than before. The blacks had gone. Evidently they believed that the occupant of the cave had expired in that final roar, and when we afterwards crept cautiously round after a detour the next morning, it was to find that the place was all open, and for fifty yards round the bushes and tree-ferns torn down and burned. The night of our escape we hardly turned from our positions, utterly exhausted as we were, and one by one we dropped asleep. When I woke first it was some time in the night, and through the trees the great stars were glinting down, and as I lay piecing together the adventures of the past day, I once more fell fast asleep to be wakened by Jimmy in the warm sunlight of a glorious morning. All black fellow gone long way. Come catch fish and find Nana. I rose to my feet to see that the doctor was busy with his patient, who was none the worse for the troubles of the past day, and what was of more consequence, he was able to speak slowly and without running off into the native tongue. We went down to the stream, Jack Penny bearing us company, and were pretty fortunate in cutting off some good-sized fish which were sunning themselves in a shallow and Tee-hee and his companions were no less successful in getting fruit, so that when we returned we were able to light a fire and enjoy a hearty meal. What I enjoyed most, though, was a good lav in the gold-clear water when we had a look at the mouth of the cave. The doctor came to the conclusion that where we were, shut in by high shelving sand rocks, was as safe a spot as we could expect, the more so that the blacks were not likely to come again, so we made this our camp, waiting to recruit a little and let the black village settle down before making any further attempt. Beside this there was our new companion, William Francis, he told us his name was, and that he had been ten years a prisoner among the blacks. Until he had recovered from the effect of his unlucky wound, we could not travel far, and our flight when we rescued my father must necessarily be swift. It was terribly anxious work waiting day after day, but the doctor's advice was good, that we must be content to exist without news for fear, in sending scouts about the village at night, we should alarm the enemy. Better let them think there is no one at hand, said the doctor, and our task will be easier. So for a whole fortnight we waited, passing our time watching the bright scaled fish glance down the clear stream, or come up it in shoals, lying gazed at the brightly plumed birds that came and shrieked and climbed about the trees above our heads, while now and then we made excursions into the open country in the direction opposite to the village, and fortunately without once encountering an enemy, but adding largely to our store of food, thanks to the bows and arrows of our friends. 
At last, one evening, after quietly talking to us some time about the suffering of, of himself and my father, Mr. Francis declared himself strong enough to accompany our retreat. "'The interest and excitement will keep me up,' he said, "'and you must not wait longer for me. Besides, I shall get stronger every day, and—' He looked from me to the doctor and then back, and passed his hand across his forehead as if to clear away a mist, while, when he began to speak again, it was not in English, and he burst into tears. "'Lie down and sleep,' the doctor said firmly, and, obedient as a child, the patient let his head sink upon the rough couch he occupied and closed his eyes. "'It is as if his body grew strong and his mental powers weakened,' said the doctor to me as soon as we were out of hearing. "'But we must wait and see.' Then we set to and once more talked over our plans, arranging that we would make our attempt next night, and after studying the compass and the position we occupied, we came to the decision that we had better work round to the far side of the village, post Mr. Francis and two of the blacks there, with our baggage, which was principally food, then make our venture, join them if successful, and go on in retreat at once. CHAPTER Thirty Nine OF BUNYIP LAND this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Bunyip Land by George Manville Finn. Chapter 39 How We Took a Last Look Round and Found It Was Time to Go. That next evening seemed as if it would never come and I lay tossing feverishly from side to side, vainly trying to obtain the rest my friend recommended. At last, though, the time came, and we were making our final preparations, when the doctor decided that we would just take a look round first by way of a scout. It was fortunate that we did, for just as it was growing dusk, after a good look round we were about to cross the rivulet and go through the cavern and up the rift back into camp, when I caught the doctor's arm without a word. He started and looked in the same direction as I did, which was right down the gully, and saw what had taken my attention, namely the stooping bodies of a couple of blacks hurrying away through the bushes at a pretty good rate. The doctor clapped his piece to his shoulder, then dropped it once more. No, he said. I might kill one, but the other would bear the news. Fortunately, they are going the other way, and not ours. Quick, my lad, let's get back to camp and start. And they'll come back with a lot of their warriors to attack us tonight and find us gone. And while they are gone, Joe, we will attack their place and carry off our prize. If only we could, I cried fervently. No ifs, Joe, he said, smiling. We will. It did not take us many minutes to reach the mouth of the cave, and as we entered I looked round again to catch sight of another black figure crouching far up the opposite bank at the foot of a great tree. I did not speak, for it was better that the black should not think he had been seen, so followed the doctor into the cave, climbed the rift with him, and found all was ready for the start. "'Black fellow all bout over their way,' said Jimmy to me in a whisper. "'How do you know?' I said quickly. "'Jimmy smell em,' he replied seriously. "'Jimmy go look bout, smell em black fellow, one eye peeping round em trees.' "'Yes, we have seen them too,' I said, and signing him to follow I found the doctor. "'The sooner we are off, the better,' he said. "'Now,' Mr. Francis, do you think you can lead us to the other side of the village, round by the north? The enemy are on the watch. Mr. Francis turned his head without a word, and, leaning upon a stout stick, started at once, and we followed in silence, just as the stars were coming out. It seemed very strange calling this savage-looking being Mr. Francis but when talking with him during his recovery from his wound one only needed to turn one's head to seem to be in conversation with a man who had never been from his civilized fellows he went steadily on 
the doctor next, and I followed the doctor. The rest of our little party, gliding silently through the forest for quite three hours, when Mr. Francis stopped, and it was decided to rest and refresh ourselves a little before proceeding farther. The doctor had settled to leave Mr. Francis here, but he quietly objected to this. No, he said, you want my help more now than ever. I am weak, but I can take you right to the hut where Carstairs is kept a prisoner. If you go alone, you will lose time, and your expedition may... He stopped short and lay down upon the earth for a few minutes, during which the doctor remained undecided. At last he bent down and whispered a few words to his patient, who immediately rose. Orders were then given to the blacks, who were to stay under the command of Jack Penny, and, followed by Jimmy, and leaving the rest of our party in the shade of an enormous tree, we set off once more. The excitement made the distance seem so short that I was astounded when a low murmur told us that we were close to the village, and stepping more cautiously, we were soon close up behind a great hut. This is the place, whispered Mr. Francis. He is kept prisoner here, or else at the great hut on the other side. Hist! I'll creep forward and listen. He went down in a stooping position and disappeared, leaving us listening to the continuous talk of evidently a numerous party of the savages. And so like did it all seem to the last time that no time might have elapsed since we crouched there, breathing heavily with excitement in the shade of the great trees that came up close to the huts. It was a painful time, for it seemed that all our schemes had been in vain, and that we might as well give up our task, unless we could come up with so strong a body of followers that we could make a bold attack. I whispered once or twice to the doctor, but he laid his hand upon my lips. I turned to Jimmy, but he had crouched down and was resting himself, according to his habit. And so quite an hour passed away before we were aware by a slight rustle that Mr. Francis was back, looming up out of the darkness like some giant, so strangely did the obscurity distort everything near at hand. Here, he said in a low voice, and bending down we all listened to his words, which came feebly, consequent upon his exertions. I have been to the far hut, and he is not there, he whispered. I came back to this and crept in unobserved. They are all talking about an expedition that's gone off to the back of the cave, to destroy us. Carstairs is in there, bound hand and foot. My poor father, I moaned. I spoke to him and told him help was near, continued Mr. Francis, and then... He muttered something in the savage's tongue and then broke down and began to sob. Take no notice, the doctor whispered to me as I stood trembling there, feeling as I did that I was only a few yards from him we had come to save, and who was lying bound there, waiting for the help that seemed as if it would never come. The doctor realized my feelings, for he came a little closer and pressed my hand. "'Don't be downhearted, my lad,' he whispered. "'We are a long way nearer to our journey's end than when we started.' "'Yes,' I said, "'but—but, nonsense, boy. "'Why, we've found your father. "'We know where he is. "'And if we can't get him away by stratagem, "'we'll go to another tribe of the blacks, "'make friends with them, "'and get them to fight on our side.' "'Nonsense, doctor,' I said bitterly. You are only saying this to comfort me. To get you to act like a man, he said sharply. Shame upon you for being so ready to give up in face of a few obstacles. I felt that the rebuke was deserved, and drew in my breath, trying to nerve myself to bear this new disappointment, and to set my brain at work scheming. It seemed to grow darker just then, the stars fading out behind the thick veil of clouds, 
and creeping nearer to the doctor I sat down beside where he knelt, listening to the incessant talking of the savages. We were not above a half a dozen yards from the back of the great hut, and now rising into quite an angry shout, now descending into a low buzz, the talk, talk, talk went on, as if they were saying the same things over and over again. I thought of my own captivity, of the way in which Jip had come to me in the night, and wondered whether it would be possible to cut away a portion of the palm-leaf wall of the hut, and so get to the prisoner. And all this while the talking went on, rising and falling, till it seemed almost maddening to hear. We must have waited there quite a couple of hours, and still there was no change. Though we could not see anything for the hut in front of us, we could tell that there was a good deal of excitement in the village, consequent, the doctor whispered, upon the absence of a number of the blacks on the expedition against us. At last he crept from me to speak to Mr. Francis. It is of no use to stay longer, I'm afraid, my lad, he whispered, unless we wait and see whether the hut is left empty when the expedition party comes back, though I fear they will not come back until morning. What are you going to do then, I said? Ask Francis to suggest a better hiding place for us, where we can go tonight and wait for another opportunity. I sighed, for I was weary of waiting for opportunities. Fast asleep, poor fellow, he whispered, coming back so silently that he startled me. Where's the black? I turned sharply to where Jimmy had been curled up, but he was gone. I crept a little way in two or three directions, but he was not with us, and I said so. How dare he go, the doctor said, angrily. He will ruin our plans. Well, what's that? Jip, I said, as the dog crept up to us and thrust his head against my hand. Jack Penny is getting anxious. It is a signal for us to come back. How do you know? We agreed upon it, I said. He was to send the dog in search of us if we did not join him in two hours, and if we were in trouble, I was either to tie something to his collar or take it off. Do neither, said the doctor, quietly. Look, they are lighting a fire. The others must have come back. I turned and saw a faint glow away over the right corner of the hut, and then there was a shout and the shrill cries of some women and children. In a moment there was a tremendous excitement in the hut before us, the savages swarming out like angry bees, and almost at the same moment the whole shape of the great long hut stood out against the sky. "'The village is on fire,' whispered the doctor. "'Back, my boy!' Francis, quick! He shook the sleeping man, whom all at once I could see, and he rose rather feebly. Then we backed slowly, more and more, in amongst the trees, seeing now that one of the light palm-leaf and bamboo huts was blazing furiously, and that another had caught fire, throwing up the cluster of slight buildings into clear relief while as we backed further and further in amongst the trees we could see the blacks, men, women, and children, running to and fro as if wild. Now would be the time, said the doctor. We might take advantage of the confusion and get your father away. Yes, I cried excitedly. I'm ready. Stop for your lives, said a voice at our elbow, and turning, I saw Mr. Francis with his swarthy face lit up by the fire. You could not get near the hut now without being seen. If you had acted at the moment the alarm began, you might have succeeded. It is now too late. No, no, I cried. Let us try. It is too late, I say, cried Mr. Francis firmly. The village is on fire and the blacks must see you. If you're taken now, you will be killed without mercy. We must risk it, I said excitedly, stepping forward. And your father, too. I recoiled, shuddering. We must get away to a place of safety, hide for a few days, and then try again. 
I shall be stronger, perhaps, then, and can help. It is right, said the doctor calmly. Come, Joe, patience. I saw that he was right, for the fire was leaping from hut to hut, and there was a glow that lit up the forest far and wide. Had any one come near, we must have been seen, but the savages were all apparently congregated near the burning huts, while the great sparks and flakes of fire rose up and floated far away above the trees, glittering like stars in the ruddy glow. Go on, then, I said, with a groan of disappointment, and Mr. Francis took the lead once more, and the doctor following, I was last. But Jimmy, I said, we must not leave him behind. He will find us, said the doctor. Come along. There was nothing for me to do but obey, so I followed reluctantly, the glow from the burning village being so great that the branches on the trees stood up clearly before us, and we had no difficulty in going on. I followed more reluctantly when I remembered Jip, and chirruped to him, expecting to find him at my heels, but he was not there. He has gone on in front, I thought, and once more I tramped wearily on, when there was a rush and a bound, and Jip leaped up at me, catching my jacket in his teeth and shaking it hard. End of chapter 39 How we took a last look round and found that it was time to go. Chapter 40 of Bunyip Land This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This reading by Lucy Burgoyne. Bunyip Land by George Manville Fenn. Chapter 40 How Jimmy Cried Cooee and Why He Called. Why, Jip, I said in a low voice, what is it, old fellow? He whined and growled and turned back, trotting towards the burning village. Yes, I know it's on fire, I said. Come along. But the dog would not follow. He whined and snuffled and ran back a little farther, when from some distance behind I heard a rustling and a panting noise which made me spring round and cock my gun. Followed, I said to myself, as I continued my retreat, but only to stop short, for from the direction in which we had come, I heard whispered, more than called, the familiar cry of the Australian savage, a cry that must, I knew, come from Jimmy, and this explained Jip's appearance. coo -wee! There it was again, and without hesitation, I walked sharply back, Jip running before me as he would not have done had there been an enemy near. There was the panting and rustling again as I retraced my steps, with the light growing plainer, and in less than a minute I came upon Jimmy trudging slowly along with a heavy burden on his back. A second glance at which made me stop speechless in my tracks. Mas Joe, Jimmy got em father. Much big heavy, Jimmy got em right fast. He panted with the exertion, for he tried to break into a trot. I could do no more than go to his side and lay my trembling hands upon the shoulder of his burden, a man whom he was carrying upon his back. Go on. I said hoarsely, Forward, Jip, and stop them. The dog understood the word forward, and went on with a rush, while I let Jimmy pass me, feeling that if he really had him, we thought he was performing my duty, while all I could do was to form the rear guard and protect them, even with my life, if we were pursued. Either the dog was leading close in front, or the black went on by a kind of instinct, in the way taken by our companions. At any rate, he went steadily on, and I followed, trembling with excitement. 
ten or a dozen yards behind, in dread lest it should not be true that we had succeeded after all. The light behind us increased so that I could plainly see the bent, helpless load upon our follower's back, but the black trudged steadily on, and I followed, panting with eagerness and ready the moment Jimmy paused to leap forward and try to take his place. The fire must have been increasing fast, and the idea was dawning upon me. Perhaps this was a plan of the blacks, who had set fire to one of the huts, and then seized the opportunity to get the prisoner away. It was like the Australian to do such a thing as this, for he was cunning and full of stratagem, and though it was improbable the idea was growing upon me, when all at once a tremendous weight seemed to fall upon my head, and I was dashed to the earth, with a sturdy savage pressing me down, dragging my hands behind me, and beginning to fasten them with some kind of thong. For the moment I was half stunned. Then the idea came to me of help being at hand. I was about to cooey and bring Jimmy to my side, but my lips closed and I set my teeth. No, I thought, he may escape. If any one is to be taken, let it be me. My turn will come later on. My captor had evidently been exerting himself a great deal to overtake me, and after binding me he contented himself by sitting upon my back, panting heavily to rest himself, while, knowing that struggling would be in vain, I remained motionless, satisfied that every minute was of inestimable value and that once the doctor knew of the black's success, he would use every exertion to get the captive in safety, and then he would be sure to come in search of me. Then I shuddered, for I remembered what Mr. Francis had said about the people being infuriated at such a time, and as I did so I felt that I was a long way yet from being a man. All at once my captor leaped up, and seizing me by the arm, he gave me a fearful wrench to make me rise to my feet. For some minutes past I had been expecting to see others of his party come up, or to hear him shout to them, but he remained silent, and stood at last hesitating or listening to the faint shouts that came from the glow beyond the trees. Suddenly he thrust me before him, shaking his waddy menacingly. The next moment he uttered a cry. There was a sharp crack as one of the war clubs striking another, and then I was struck down by two men struggling fiercely. There were some inarticulate words and a snarling and panting like two wild beasts engaged in a hard fight, and then a heavy fall, a dull thud, and the sound of a blow, as if someone had struck a tree branch with a club. I could see nothing from where I lay, but as soon as I could recover myself, I was struggling to my feet, when a black figure loomed over me, and a familiar voice said hoarsely, "'Where must Joe knife? Cut em tring. Jimmy,' I said, "'my father. Set em down. Come look, Mass Joe.' Come, long fuss. Jip, take care, Jimmy. Father till and come back again, again. As Jimmy spoke, he thrust his hand into my pocket for my knife, while I was too much interested in his words to remind him that there was my large sheath knife in my belt. Come long, he said, as he set me free, and we were starting when he stopped short. No tie black fellow up first. No, can't top. Before I knew what he meant to do, he had given the prostrate black a sharp rap on the head with his waddy. Jimmy, I said, you kill him. Kill him? No, make him sleep, sleep. Come long. He went off at a sharp walk, 
and I followed, glancing back anxiously from time to time and listening, till we reached the spot where he had set down his burden, just as the doctor came back, having missed me, and being in dread lest I had lost my way. I did not speak, I could not, but threw myself on my knees beside the strange, long-haired, thickly bearded figure, seated with its back against a tree, while the doctor drew back as soon as he realized that it was my father the black had saved. End of chapter 40、Chapter、Forty One of Bunyip Land. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This reading by Lucy Burgoyne. Bunyip Land by George Manville Fenn. Chapter Forty One. How Jimmy heard the Bunyip speak, and it all proved to be big tough. I need not recount what passed just then. But few words were spoken, and there was no time for displays of affection. One black had seen and pursued Jimmy, and others might be on our track, so that our work was far from being half done even now. Can you walk, sir? said the doctor sharply. My poor father raised his face toward the speaker and uttered some incoherent words. No, no, he has been kept bound by the ankles till the use of his feet has gone, said Mr. Francis, who had remained silent up to now. Can't walk, Jimmy carry em, said the black in a whisper. Don't make noise, hear em, black fellow. You are tired, said the doctor. Let me take a turn. Jimmy made no objection, but bore the gun. While the doctor carried my father slowly and steadily on for some distance. Then the black took a turn and bore him right to the place where our black followers were waiting and where Jack Penny was anxiously expecting our return. I thought you wasn't coming back, he said, as Jimmy set down the burden, and then in a doleful voice he continued, I couldn't do that. My back's so weak. But Ty Hi and his friends saw our difficulty and cut down a couple of long stout bamboos whose tops were soon cleared of leaves and shoots. Two holes were made in the bottom of a light sack whose contents were otherwise distributed, the poles thrust through, and my poor father gently laid upon the sack. Four of us then went to the ends of the poles, which were placed upon our shoulders, and keeping step as well as we could, we went slowly and steadily on, Mr. Francis taking the lead and acting as guide. Our progress was very slow, but we journeyed steadily on hour after hour, taking advantage of every open part of the forest. That was not likely to show traces of our passage, and obliged blindly to trust to Mr. Francis as to the way. It was weary work, but no one seemed to mind, each, even Jack Penny, taking his turn at the end of one of the bamboos, and when at last the morning broke and the bright sunshine showed us our haggard faces, we still kept on. The daylight helping us to make better way till the sun came down so fiercely that we were obliged to halt in a dense part of the forest where some huge trees gave us shade. Mr. Francis looked uneasily about, and I caught his anxious gaze directed so often in different directions that I whispered to the doctor my fears that he had lost his way. Never mind, lad, replied the doctor. We have the compass. Our way is south towards the coast, anywhere as long as we get beyond reach of the blacks. No, don't disturb him. Let him sleep. 
I was about to draw near and speak to my father, in whose careworn hollow face I gazed with something approaching fear. His eyes were closed, and now, for the first time, I could see the ravages that the long captivity had made in his features. But, mingled with these, there was a quiet, restful look that made me draw back in silence from where the litter had been laid and join my companions in partaking of such food as we had. Watch was set, the doctor choosing the post of guard, and then, lying anywhere, we all sought for relief from our weariness in sleep. As for me, one moment I was lying gazing at the long unkept hair and head of him I had to come to seek, and thinking that I would rest like that, rising now and then to see and watch with the doctor. The next I was wandering away in dreams through the forest in search of my father, and then all was blank till I started up to catch at my gun, for someone had touched me on the shoulder. There is nothing wrong, my lad, said the doctor, fortunately, for I have been a bad sentry, and have just woke to find that I have been sleeping at my post. Sleeping, I said, still confused from my own deep slumbers. Yes, he said, everyone has been asleep from utter exhaustion. I looked around, and there were our companions sleeping heavily. I've been thinking that we may be as safe here as farther away, continued the doctor, so let them rest still for we have a tremendous task before us to get down to the coast. Just then Jimmy leaped up, staring, his hand on his waddy, and his eyes wandering in search of danger. This being absent, his next idea was regarding food. Much hungry, he said. Want mutton, want damper, want eatums. The rest were aroused and water being close at hand in a little stream. We soon had our simple store of food brought out and made a refreshing meal, of which my father, as he lay, partook mechanically, but without a word. The doctor then bathed and dressed his ankles, which were in a fearfully swollen and injured state. Like Mr. Francis, he seemed as if his long captivity had made him think like the savages among whom he had been, while the terrible mental anxiety he had suffered along with his bodily anguish had resulted in complete prostration. He ate what was given to him, or drunk with his eyes closed, and when he opened them once or twice, it was not to let them wander round upon us who attended to him, but to go straight up in a vague manner and mutter a few of the native words before sinking back into a stupor-like sleep. I gazed at the doctor with my misery speaking in my eyes, for it was so different a meeting from that which I had imagined. There was no delight, no anguished tears, no pressing to a loving father's heart, we had found him a mere hopeless wreck, apparently like Mr. Francis, and the pain I suffered seemed more than I could bear. Patience, the doctor said to me, with a smile. Yes, I know what you want to ask me. Let's wait and see. He was dying slowly, Joe, and we have come in to save his life. You are sure, I said. No, he answered. Not sure, but I shall hope. Now let's get on again till dark, and then we'll have a good rest in the safest place we can find. In the exertion and toil that followed, I found some relief. My interest, too, was excited by seeing how much Mr. Francis seemed to change hour by hour, and how well he knew the country which he led us through. He found for us a capital resting place in a rocky gorge, where, unless tracked step by step, there was no fear of our being surprised. 
Here there was water and fruit, and, shorter distance as we had come, the darkness made it necessary that we should wait for day. Then followed days and weeks of slow travel through a beautiful country, always south and west. We did not go many miles some days, for the burden we carried made our passage very slow. Sometimes, too, our black scouts came back to announce that we were travelling towards some black village, or that a hunting party was in our neighbourhood, and though these people might have been friendly, we took the advice of our black companions and avoided them, either by making a detour or by waiting in hiding till they had passed. Water was plentiful, and Jimmy and Ty High never let us want for fruit, fish, or some animal for food. Now it would be a wild pig or a small deer, more often birds, for these literally swarmed in some of the lakes and marshes round which we made our way. The country was so thinly inhabited that we could always light a fire in some shut-in part of the forest without fear, and so we got on, running risks at times, but on the whole meeting with but few adventures. After getting over the exertion and a little return of fever from too early leaving his sick bed of boughs, Mr. Francis mended rapidly, his wound healing well and his mind daily growing clearer. Every now and then, when excited, he had relapses and looked at us hopelessly, talking quickly in the savage's tongue, but these grew less frequent, and there would be days during which he would be quite free. He grew so much better than at the end of a month he insisted upon taking his place at one of the bamboos, proving himself to be a tender nurse to our invalid in his return. And all this time my father seemed to alter but little. The doctor was indefatigable in his endeavours, but though he soon wrought a change in his patient's bodily infirmities to such an extent, that at last my father could walk first a mile, then a couple, and then ease the bearers of half their toil. His mind seemed gone, and he went on in a strangely vacant way. As time went on, and our long journey continued, he would walk slowly by my side, resting on my shoulder, and with his eyes always fixed upon the earth. If he was spoken to, he did not seem to hear, and he never opened his lips, save to utter a few words in the savage tongue. I was in despair, but the doctor still bade me hope. Time works wonders, Joe, he said. His bodily health is improving wonderfully, and at last that must act upon his mind. But it does not, I said. He has walked at least six miles today, as if in a dream. Oh, doctor, I exclaimed, we cannot take him back like this. You keep bidding me hope, and it seems no use. He smiled at me in his calm, satisfied way. And yet I've done something, Joe, he said. We found him. We got him away. We had him first a hopeless invalid. He is now rapidly becoming a strong, healthy man. Healthy? In body, boy, recollect that for years he seemed to have been kept chained up by the savages like some wild beast, perhaps through some religious scruples against destroying the life of a white man who was wise in trees and plants. Likely enough they feared that if they killed such a medicine man, it might result in a plague or curse. That is why they spared us both, said Mr. Francis, who had heard the latter part of our conversation, and the long course of being kept imprisoned, there seemed to completely freeze up his brain as he did mine. 
That and the fever and blows I received, he said excitedly. There were times when... He clapped his hands to his head as if he dared not trust himself to speak, and turned away. Yes, that is it, my lad, said the doctor quietly. His brain has become paralyzed, as it were. A change may come at any time. Under the circumstances, in spite of your mother's anxiety, we'll wait and go slowly homeward. Let me see, he continued, turning to a little calendar he kept. Tomorrow begins the tenth month of our journey. Come, be of good heart. We've done wonders. Nature will do the rest. Two days later we had come to a halt in a lovely little glen through which trickled a clear spring whose banks were brilliant with flowers. We were all busy cooking and preparing to halt there for the night. My father had walked the whole of the morning and now had wandered slowly away along the banks of the stream. Mr. Francis being a little further on while Jimmy was busy standing beside a pool spearing fish. I glanced up once or twice to see that my father was standing motionless on the bank, and then I was busying myself once more, cutting soft boughs to make a bed, when Jimmy came bounding up to me with his eyes starting and mouth open. "'We're a gun! We're a gun!' he cried. "'Big bunyip down, mung trees!' Try to eat Jimmy. Ask for em dinner, all aloud, oh. Hush, be quiet, I cried, catching his arm. What do you mean? Big bunyip down, mung stones say. Who, much hungry, where my boy? Someone said that, I cried. Yes, much hungry, where my boy? Want eat black boy, eat Jimmy. What nonsense, Jimmy, I said. Don't be such a donkey. There are no bunyips. Jimmy heard him say em, he cried, stamping his spear on the ground. Just then I involuntarily glanced in the direction where my father stood and saw him stoop and pick up a flower or two. My heart gave a bound. The next minute he was walking slowly toward Mr. Francis, to whom he held out the flowers, and then I felt giddy for I saw them coming slowly towards our camp, both talking earnestly, my father seeming to be explaining something about the flowers he had picked. The doctor had seen it too, and he drew me away, after cautioning Jimmy to be silent. And there we stood while those two rescued prisoners talked quietly and earnestly together, but it was in the savage tongue. I need not tell you of my joy, or the doctor's triumphant looks. It is the beginning, Joe, he said, and hardly had he spoken when Jimmy came up. Not bunyip tall, he said scornfully. Not no bunyip, all big tup. Jimmy mass Joe, for to talk away, say, where my boy? End of chapter 41「ファイブアウトオブフォーティーワン」「ファイブアウトオブフォーティーワン」「ファイブアウトオブフォーティーワン」「ファイブアウトオブフォーティーワン」「ファイブアウトオブフォーティーワン」「ファイブアウトオブフォーティーワン」「ファイブアウトオブフォーティーワン」「ファイブアウトオブフォーティーワン」「ファイブアウトオブフォーティーワン」「ファイブアウトオブフォーティーワン」「ファイブアウトオブフォーティーワン」By George Manville Fenn. Chapter 42 How I Must Wind Up the Story. It was the beginning of a better time, for from that day, what was like the dawn of a return of his mental powers brightened and strengthened into the full sunshine of reason. And by the time we had been waiting at Tihi's village for the coming of the captain with his schooner. We had heard the whole of my father's adventures from his own lips, 
and how he had been struck down from behind by one of the blacks while collecting, and kept a prisoner ever since. I need not tell you of his words to me, his thanks to the doctor, and his intense longing for the coming of the schooner, which seemed to be an age before it came in sight. We made Tihi and his companions happy by our supply of presents, for we wanted to take nothing back. And at last, one bright morning, we sailed from the glorious, continent-like island, with two strong, middle-aged men on board, both of whom were returning to a civilised land with the traces of their captivity in their hair and beards, which were white as snow. Neither shall I tell you of the safe voyage home and of the meeting there. Joy had come at last where sorrow had sojourned so long, and I was happy in my task that I had fulfilled. I will tell you, though, what the captain said in his hearty way over and over again. To me it used to be, Well, you have growed. Why, if you had stopped another year, you'd have been quite a man. I say, though, I never thought you'd have done it, upon my word. Similar words these to those often uttered by poor, prejudiced, obstinate old nurse. To Jack Penny the captain was always saying, I say, young un, how you've growed too, not upwards, but beam ways. Why, hang me, if I don't think you'll make a fine man yet. And so he did, a great, strong, six-foot fellow, with a voice like a trombone. Jack Penny is a sheep farmer on his own account now, and after a visit to England with my staunch friend the doctor, where I gained some education, and used to do a great deal of business for my father, who was one of the greatest collectors in the South, I returned home, and went to stay a week with Jack Penny. I say, he said, laughing, my back's as strong as a lion's now. How it used to ache! We were standing at the door of his house, looking north, for we had been talking of our travels, when all at once I caught sight of what looked like a little white tombstone under a eucalyptus tree. Why, what's that? I said. Jack Penny's countenance changed, and there were a couple of tears in the eyes of the great strong fellow, as he said slowly, That's to the memory of Jip, the best dog as ever lived. I must not end without a word about Jimmy, my father's faithful companion in his botanical trips. Jimmy nearly went mad for joy when I got back from England, dancing about like a child. He was always at the door, black and shining as ever, and there was constantly something to be done. One day he had seen the biggest old man kangaroo as ever was, and this time there was a wallaby to be found, another the announcement that the black cockatoos were in the woods, or else it would be Mas Joe, Mas Joe, Jimmy won't go catch fish very bad, do come a day. And I? Well, I used to go, and it seemed like being a boy again to go on some expedition with my true old companion and friend. Yes, friend, Jimmy was always looked upon as a friend, and long before then my mother would have fed and clothed him given him anything he asked. But Jimmy was wild, and happiest so, and I found him just as he was when I left home, faithful and boyish and winning, and often ready to say, When Mash Joe ready, go and find him father all over again. End of chapter 42 End of Bunyipland by George Manville Fenn